we've heard from two large software companies with decades of experience in Bentley and um, Innate. Now let's hear from an upstart. It gives me great pleasure to introduce Greg Lawton from Nodes and Links, and he's going to tell us how his partners, Mott McDonald, are using their Aegea system on HS2. Uh, Greg, you can open your video. So Greg co-founded the Greg co-founded go. Nodes and Links, a deep technology company whose mission it is to improve the delivery performance of capital infrastructure projects around the world. And I found this interesting quote on uh, on his LinkedIn profile. My belief is that we are transitioning from the age of interconnectivity to the age of complexity, where emergent effects will impact what we do as much or more than the tools we control. A result of this shift is that technology will take on decision-making responsibility for more of the things we do. Uh, Greg, was formerly, bleh, Greg was formerly with BAE Submarines, BAE System Submarines business, and he holds an MBA from the University of Manchester and a Master of Physics and Astronomy from the University of Durham. Greg, thank you and uh, take it away. Wonderful, thank you very much. Let me do the whole job of sharing my screen. Here we go, so I will share that. Wonderful, Phil, can you see that? Yes, I can. Wonderful, right, I'll get going. So, thank you very, very much for the introduction. Before I start, Dan, that was excellent. I really enjoyed that. Right, I'll jump on now. So, um, a lovely introduction there. This is myself, I thought. Let's say where I'm from. I'm from Manchester in England. I live in Switzerland right now. And as Phil just said, I founded and I am the CEO of an upstart called Nodes and Links. And today, what I'm going to talk everyone through is the work we've been doing with HS2. I'm going to talk to you about how we've opened the door to a nine figure cost reduction opportunity, which we're exploring with them. And I'm going to tell you what my personal view is on the future of project delivery and how it's going to change from, from the ground up. Jumping to answer the second point, uh, it's my view that the roles within the project management function are going to change because of technology. Um, nodes and links exist to build part of that technology, specifically to automate and augment the roles, uh, the role of the project planner. Uh, so I've got people and teams in the UK, Switzerland, Greece, and Cyprus. And we're being backed by a number of venture capital investors. So it's quite an exciting space. So a little bit of the, the story here. We're living through a very unique age. And uh, as some of the early speakers were saying, it's being driven by the internet. It's being driven by cloud computing and it's being driven by artificial intelligence. And these three things together unlock automation, augmentation, and control from a distance. Now, artificial intelligence, I just jump on. What it fundamentally means is that people's roles will change. Just as they did when computers were first invented, and just as they did when software moved to the cloud and mobile phones became a very, very common, common thing. We're now in a, a new iteration, which is moving intelligence to the cloud, which you know, some people have coined as, as this. Now, roles that consist of common sense and are largely based around social interaction, they'll change the least, but no role will be exempt in totality. And the way I think about this is just think about what your role was 20 years ago compared to today. Think about the fact that technology is accelerating and think, well, what would your role be in five years time? Now with regards to project planning, our view is that this role will change like this. Planners will simply spend less time on simple tasks and more time making strategic decisions. And this will be geared towards driving better project outcomes. So an example of this is uh, things around schedule risk. An example of this is acceleration opportunities. Now, one task that planners need to do today is called a quantitative schedule risk analysis. And it's quite an old technique. 
this is focused on answering two questions. When will my project end? And how much risk do I need to consider when I commit to a date? Now, this was the core focus of our work with HS2. Now, the easiest way of answering the first question is to look at the date of the last activity. Um, but best practice is based on something a little different. Best practice is to do this, which is to run a statistical simulation to account for risk and uncertainty. This decision is very important because it underpins stakeholder expectations, but it also underpins top level financial outcomes. And what I mean by that, an example, is the setting of a schedule risk budget. So schedule risk typically accounts for between 0.5 and 2.5% of project budgets. And what it traditionally does is cover the indirect costs of running the project's operations past its end date. So we're talking about the lights, the management orb heads, the site costs, etc. They are the direct costs that are attributable to delay as well, but they're more context specific. Now, for a 100 billion pound project, what we're talking about here is a budget of between half a billion pounds and 2.5 billion. It's quite a sizable amount of money. And with the average profit rate in the construction industry sitting about 0.5% last year, these rates are the difference between a doubling of profit or an enormous loss. So there's a big strategic point around the decision that, sh that planners have to feed into. Now, if, if I was to put this in the, the typical pitch that I have to make to venture capital investors, the problem statement was that QSRAs are time consuming. They're based on unbounded judgment and they don't really help to answer the question, how do I do better than what I've planned? The solution, well, you automate elements of the process and use AI to bound judgment and identify areas of improvement. And this is where technology comes in. So what we ended up building was a platform called Aegis. And here's a little example of it. So what Aegis is, is it's actually two things. It's an infrastructure that makes it easy, simple, and very, very quick to bolt on advanced analytics and artificial intelligence into complex projects. And the second is it's an interactive um, system that enables people to engage. So think of it, if you're a software developer, it's infrastructure and front end. Um, we built this because general analytics platforms that exist currently, so I'm talking very general analytics platforms, were really not good enough for the bespoke, the bespoke nature of projects and the bespoke activities and tasks and objectives that people on projects had to actually do. Now for HS2, what we built was this. Um, and this is an in-depth scenario testing engine that gets around um, a big problem in data science called the limit problem. So put really simply, um, even on a simple project, of let's say a thousand activities, there actually isn't enough computing power in the world to model everything that can possibly happen. So it's finding clever ways to get around that that's still far in advance of current methodologies like Monte Carlo. Now what this engine did that was new is that it told us which activities were important beyond the critical path and how much each activity could be delayed until the impact um, would be much more than itself, so it would impact the project's time-based KPIs. So this is far in advance of what exists at the moment. Now, specifically, what this allowed us to do was to inform the creation here of the data for the analysis, which is also known as the risk-ready schedule in, in the project world. It allowed us to create bounded limits for risk and uncertainty and to really inform that conversation. And it allowed us very easily to understand where improvements could be made as the project as the project's being planned and as the project's being delivered to take risk out of the equation and to make reductions in those strategic budgets. Now, 
all of this relates to benefit and massive tactical savings. So we've got here, um, we achieved a 245% increase in accuracy, 73% reduction in man hours, 61% reduction in lead time, and 57% increase in auditability. So it was a big success and they all related, uh, I can't remember the exact figure, it was, a, it was in the tens of millions in terms of tactical savings on workload and, and process. But these to me are insignificant compared to what the strategic goal was. Let's remember the strategic goal is how do we reduce this? And this is actually where now we need to look forward and where the vision of our friends at Mott McDonald comes in and the vision of a, a joint proposition that we put forward called SORT. Now, in short, once you know where risks lie in a, in a project, you can do two things about it. You can replan, Ooh. you can replan here to reduce the impact of the risk occurring, and you can create risk actions here to reduce the probability of it occurring. So here we're playing with the impact and probability elements of risk. Now this has the, the added requirement that it must be monitored and adjusted over time, but the benefits, obviously the strategic benefits and the tactical benefits of doing this are far outweigh multiple orders of magnitude above the actual effort, which is actually put in standard today of actually monitoring and, and going about and this is specifically the scope of engagement for our next project with HS2, which is actually uh, just about to kick off. So we're looking to take all of the success that we had with the first technology development and now deploy it into a large part of their project to look for strategic risk savings. There's a, an additional element that we've added onto this, which is building on the traditional DCMA 14 point check here. Um, it's going far, far beyond that. Um, and that was purely because there were elements of data quality that weren't being picked up in today's quality checking that really had an impact on the decision making. So when we were developing the algorithms, we had to do something about that. Now, looking far in the future, this is really just a tip of the iceberg. That's what happened. That's what's happening with ourselves and actually the wider industry. I'm working on a, a number of concepts that all surround augmenting and automating the roles and tasks of a planner, uh, including this one, which is looking at the integration of weather data. Um, so very simply connecting activities and um, locations with weather forecasts and being able to do predictive analytics around there, linking to claim scenarios and cash flow. But there's plenty more, plenty more out there. And ultimately, really, what we're doing is we're all working towards the same goal. And I had a lot of fun putting this animation together. Now, the goal is about aligning man and machine. There we go. To deliver better projects. And with that terrible, terrible final visualization, I'm going to stop there. If there's any questions, please feel free to fill them in the chat or follow up with me afterwards is up to you. Thank you so, so much, Greg. Always nice to see a thumbnail of Pertmaster in a presentation. It's one of the products that I Pertmaster was a revolution. Thank you. I, I had was. a lot of fun selling it. I had the oil and gas <laughs> section at the time, and it was, uh, it was, it was really good fun. And, and looking at the attendee list, I can see some people that I, that I worked with back then, and it's uh, – it was a lovely time, but no, uh, excellent presentation. Really fascinating the work that you're doing with HS2. I, I love the uh, analytics presentation layers you've built. So, um, so thank you.